Hi, I'm Hannes. Hello, I'm Dominic. And today we'll learn about how to use GNNs for neural algorithmic reasoning. And if you want to join this reading group session with yourself, you'll find all of the information in the description. Uh, Andrea is uh, my, my co-presenter. We're both uh, PhD students under GNTime. Um, Andrea uh, has focused on uh, graph neural networks and especially on graph neural networks uh, in the context of decision making for reinforcement learning. Um, but also has worked on graph neural networks for uh, drug to drugs play effect prediction uh, and many other projects in the kind of biological domain. Um, yeah, she's brilliant. Oh, all right, I'm I'm convinced that she's brilliant. And then Andrea, do you want to introduce LP? Of course, but I have some. I've known it before seven, eight years. I lost count at this point. We've done both our undergrads and our masters together in Cambridge. And I've, uh, I've always admired his strong theoretical background. And uh, since we started our PhD, he's done a lot of amazing work on reasoning. He's more recently looked at um, crystals and a lot of stuff I don't understand. So um, he, he can answer a lot of questions. If, he, if you're curious about this stuff, um, he, he has a lot of interesting stuff to say. Yeah, maybe we will get some crystal papers into the reading group as well at some point, but let's get into neural algorithmic reasoning today and why why graph neural networks are interesting there. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, welcome uh, to, the, to the presentation. Um, feel free to interrupt and ask any questions as we go along. I will try to keep an eye out for the chat, um, but also feel free to just unmute yourself and just ask the question. Um, yeah, let's get started. Um, so in computer science, we care about solving problems. Uh, and there have been two kind of very, like very broadly, two kind of ways to try and uh, solve problems. The first is the kind of classical approach. We sit down with pen and a piece of paper, and we try to work out uh, kind of a list of instructions on how we could solve a particular problem, given certain assumptions about the input data. And there's many examples for kind of these algorithms. Um, merge sort, as you can see in the, in the top left. Uh, there is a various graph algorithms like shortest path, spanning trees, algorithms. They have all been written by people by hand. Um, the second kind of broad approach is that of, uh, of neural networks. Yeah, uh, that, of, that of neural networks. Um, neural networks are kind of, uh, in many ways, the, the opposite. They, the, the entire point is that we don't have to sit and write down the, uh, the, the, the algorithm. The neural network works it out for us by looking at uh, training data, so at uh, input and output data, and then trying to figure out the relationship between the two. So rather than us having to write it down uh, by hand or work it out, the neural network learns it for us. Uh, and these two approaches have kind of different properties. And so in the algorithm case, uh, we have several very positive uh, kind of attributes, like they generalize strongly. So for instance, a graph algorithm will work no matter what type of graph uh, we, we kind of give it. So it doesn't matter whether it's an erdos Reni or um, a very regular graph. Uh, the, the length of the list, for instance, when you're sorting a list, doesn't matter. Um, algorithms also tend to be composed. So it's very commonly the case that we will reuse algorithms we have already written to write new algorithms. And because we have written them by hand and often give a correctness proof together with the actual algorithm, uh, we have guaranteed correctness. And this is obviously uh, a very nice property to have. The other thing is that because we have it as a list of instructions and often also a proof of correctness, we can understand very well why the algorithm works. So the algorithm is interpretable. Now, classical algorithms have the downside. The first is we have to uh, write them ourselves. Um, the other is that we often need to make very precise assumptions about the format in which we receive the data. So uh, in um, the graph algorithm, for instance, we might need to assume that all the edge weights are uh, positive or to have no negative cycles. And if that isn't true, then uh, it'll fail entirely. Uh, the other problem is that uh, the task might be slightly different than we assumed it was. So for instance, uh, in Google Maps, uh, while we can write an algorithm to always find the shortest path from point A to B, that might not always be the path we actually want to give to the user. Uh, we might, for instance, want to take traffic into account and then find a different kind of metric by which uh, we want to find the path we want to suggest to the user. So 
uh, classical algorithms tend to not be robust to slightly changing the task. Neural networks tend to be much easier to adapt. Neural networks, on the other hand, they operate on the raw data. So uh, for instance, we don't need to pre-process the images. Typically, we just kind of uh, give the, the, the images to the, to the neural network. Um, they tend to also work on, like, if there's noise in the training data, then neural networks will learn to deal with that noise. And so uh, it doesn't matter if there is some sort of uh, level of noise in the data. Uh, we've also recently seen that the kind of big neural networks that we've trained, like uh, in language, natural language processing or in images, are reusable across tasks. So for instance, uh, if we have a particular language problem, we can take one of the big pre-trained language models and, and reuse those neural networks uh, on this task. The, the point is that they require a lot of data though, and they are unreliable when extrapolating. So systematic generalization tends to be a big issue with neural networks. They tend to work very well on the training distribution, but um, if you, for instance, uh, extrapolate that distribution, so for instance, you give it a graph that is bigger than it's ever seen before, it tends to very quickly degrade in its performance. And as everybody knows, neural networks are kind of a bit of a black box at the moment. Um, so as a, if you look at these side by side, you can see that they are kind of uh, very complementary. Uh, and so the kind of uh, initial starting point of this kind of research direction that kind of better uh, uh, pioneered uh, is that can we get the best of both worlds? So can we get neural networks or something in between that has these properties from algorithms like strong generalization and compositionality? Uh, So in this, in this presentation and in most of this line of work, um, the general focus has been on graph algorithms because they're a great kind of um, example problem on which we can kind of study this. And so typically the input will be um, a weighted graph with a source node, and then um, we'll have various algorithms we have to try and solve on this graph. Um, they will mostly be of the type of like trying to find the shortest path. Uh, and so in this case, the source node is S and the shortest path to the node minus two is then highlighted in, uh, in, in gray. Yeah, so um, just to give you a bit more of an idea of what kind of the data specifically looks like. Um, so typically algorithms will be in some sort of kind of for loop and uh, you can kind of get a trajectory of the intermediate states of the data structure uh, of the algorithm. So on a graph algorithm, typically the input graph will also be reused as, as the kind of data structure. Uh, and so for instance, for uh, yeah, we'll, 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 uh, we'll drop links uh, for the paper uh, into the chat. Yeah, coming, coming right up. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll have like a kind of a trajectory. So for instance, for Bellman Ford, each node will contain the current shortest path we found to the source node. And this kind of gets updated at each step until we reach convergence. Um, and so the, the way this typically looks is we have our input uh, node features X, uh, and our edge features E, and then we kind of compute, uh, we make a prediction for the next node state Y, or uh, Y is kind of an output of our uh, of the, the, the problem on which we can then uh, get the next uh, input uh, at time T plus one. And so for our neural network, we uh, kind of have a similar kind of executing architecture where we have uh, latent variables um, because neural networks tend to want to uh, operate on much higher dimensional uh, inputs. So in Bellman Ford, we would have uh, a single uh, single node feature, which would be the current shortest path. But neural networks tend to not work very well if you have only a single kind of input feature. So there's kind of uh, an encoder that would encode from X to Z. Uh, and then there would be a decoding from uh, H or Z to, to Y, uh, because neural networks need to operate on these high dimensional spaces. But the, the kind of uh, operating structure is the same, and that will be done with uh, a graph neural network. This is kind of where the graph neural network comes in. And this whole kind of architecture paradigm is uh, called encode, process, decode, because we encode to a high dimensional space, we process it in our case with a graph neural network, and then we decode it back to the kind of original abstract encoder. And so Petar, in his iClear paper, um, managed to show that indeed we can train a graph neural network or like this encode process decode architecture to learn to execute graph algorithms and still maintain many of these positive properties like systematic generalization uh, when doing prediction. 
So the way they, they trained this is they took these uh, kind of intermediate steps of the algorithm and then directly supervised the architecture to be able to execute this one kind of step and then apply it for people. Uh, yeah, next slide. Um, so yeah, this is kind of the, uh, yeah, the general idea of this kind of research direction and why it's interesting. Uh, and this is, was kind of the starting point uh, for me and uh, for the first paper and for the, for the second paper. So um, graph neural networks uh, align very well with dynamic programming, which means that uh, graph neural networks tend to be very good at uh, learning dynamic programming problems. And many problems on graphs will be uh, solved with dynamic programming as a technique. Uh, and yeah, uh, Velashkovich et al, the iClear paper, uh, kind of found many inductive biases that were very good, and the encode process decode architecture. They also showed that max aggregation in graph neural networks tends to work best. And they showed that this is possible. So the systematic generalization is achievable with strong supervision on the project. And here are some papers with uh, further theoretical work on this kind of algorithmic reasoning direction, if you're interested. So then the, the, the first paper uh, is how to transfer algorithmic reasoning to learn your algorithm. And so the high level research question was, uh, in practice, say, if we want to kind of learn to execute an algorithm, we may not have access to the full trajectory. We may, have, we may only have access to the input and to the output uh, of, the, of the kind of what happened. And F might again be unknown. And so the problem is that without these intermediate steps of the algorithm, it's much harder to achieve systematic generalization. Uh, to the extent that we were like, this is in the first instance too difficult of a problem. And so we decided um, to add the assumption that we have access to a similar algorithm where we do have access to the intermediate steps. And this is kind of uh, a very common uh, assumption in uh, machine learning, where if we don't have enough data for a particular problem, we try to find similar data where, or similar task or area where we have more data and can then use that. And so then the question becomes, how can we transfer the inductive bias or the algorithm, algorithmic reasoning to a new algorithm? So yeah, uh, we broadly looked at two classes of algorithms, um, parallel and sequential. Uh, so I'll kind of here in the slide kind of define what we mean when we say two algorithms or something. So this is the pseudocode for kind of a sequential graph algorithm. Um, and kind of the general structure is there's some priority queue, and then we loop through this priority queue, removing elements, and then updating the kind of key function in this priority queue. And so many algorithms, graph algorithms, can be kind of um, captured in this, in this kind of framework in a pseudocode. And all you need to do is change the, the function with which you kind of this relaxed edge function with which you kind of uh, change the key for all the neighbors that, of the node you just removed. And um, so for instance, Prims and Dijkstra. Uh, Prims is a minimum spanning tree problem. Uh, Dijkstra is the shortest path problem. Uh, both kind of uh, can be written in a pseudocode. You just need to change the relaxed edge function. And uh, we have uh, plenty more algorithms uh, that, that are similar, but basically, um, given the pseudocode, any algorithm which you can implement by just changing the relaxed edge function will be considered similar. Uh, yeah, I've, I've not given the parallel pseudocode, but you can look it up in the paper. It's, it's just a slightly different, it's a different for loop. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So, Actually, can you go back one slide? Uh, I, forgot to, I forgot to mention uh, one thing. Yeah, so um, as you can see in the relaxed edge function, each node has, uh, in, the par in the sequential setting, uh, has kind of two key attributes. It has the, the key, which is the current shortest path or the current uh, weight to the, the spanning tree, and the predecessor. Um, this is because uh, at the prediction stage, at the decode stage, we kind of keep track of two things, namely the key and the predecessor. So the predecessor refers to the node so say we have a shortest path, the predecessor refers to the uh, node that is the predecessor in the shortest path. So if we have the shortest path from u, v to w, then w would point to v, and v would point to u, and u would point to itself. And so this gives us two ways to kind of verify how well um, our neural network has learned to kind of execute this algorithm. So there will be kind of always two metrics in which we kind of uh, check. It's the key prediction and the predecessor prediction. Uh, we'll generally measure the key and mean squared uh, error and the predecessor and just, uh, accuracy or error rate. Sorry, next slide. So to kind of check this transfer, we uh, investigate kind of a variety of possible um, uh, approaches. 
So let the orangey uh, kind of color be one algorithm for which we do have access to the intermediate steps. And so uh, the kind of classic approach would be uh, given our new problem, uh, which uh, uh, take as, as light blue, um, we would want to kind of reuse the processor, but freezing it uh, of the orange problem, and then want to learn a new encoder and decoder to kind of uh, execute this, this algorithm. So we, we need different encoders and decoders because the different algorithms might have a different number of uh, input fields in each node. Um, the alternative is to rather than freezing the, the, the processor, which was pre trained on the kind of orange task. Uh, is that we kind of don't freeze it and let it just be fine-tuned together with the encoder and decoder as a green line. Now, both of these approaches have, have problems in the fine-tuned, you could forget where you came from, and so you forget, could forget the information encoded in the uh, orange processor. Um, and in the frozen, you might lack the ability to slightly adapt the processor, uh, which kind of could heavily limit the kind of uh, the, the prediction of the neural network. And so, we also test this kind of transfer with two processors in parallel, one where it's frozen and the other one where it's not frozen uh, to kind of allow it both the benefits of uh, not forgetting the original uh, learned processor, as well as being having enough kind of modeling capacity to be able to change the, the process. These will generally be kind of considered the, the, the transfer uh, approaches. The other alternative is to look at a multitask approach where rather than pre-training the processor, we train uh, one processor at the same time for both tasks. So we'll have two encoders for each of the problems and two decoders, and the processor has to learn kind of how to solve both problems at the same time. And this is kind of the multitask approach. And the transfer approach is kind of what's typical in, in uh, machine learning. This is kind of uh, what would typically be used in NLP or in computer vision. Uh, but our hypothesis coming into this project was that this is much less likely to work because there is no guarantee that uh, similar algorithms would yield similar weights in the processor. That are, when I say similar, I mean close to each other in the, in the weight space. Uh, and so it's not obvious uh, that transfer sh should work. Uh, yeah, next slide. No, let's, let's just have a second on that slide, uh, one more. Um, yeah. Why is it, yeah, like the, those are typical transfer learning questions, right? Why are they especially interesting or different for um, your neural algorithmic reasoning tasks than they are for computer vision tasks? Like you named one reason already um, that, well, maybe for, for some algorithms, the, the weights are less likely to be, or have less of a reason to be the same than for images, but yeah, what, what else? Well, so this algorithmic reason, like algor like trying to execute algorithms, so this kind of algorithmic reasoning um, has a st strong requirement to the task that the final solution be systematically generalizable. So these kind of previous transfer approaches have been kind of developed on the, we simply wanted to work on the training distribution that we're going to train it on. Even though we have less data, we still just are, are test data will also be from the same distribution as we train on. But in this setting, we will train on graphs of a certain size, but we might test on graphs that are much larger. And so our, uh, this kind of systematic generalization requirement to the processor is, is, uh, is different between kind of computer vision and NLP and uh, this setting. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, so we made kind of two architecture, uh, oh, sorry, we made two major architecture changes um, compared to the original uh, architecture proposed in the neural executor. So in the neural executor, to execute two algorithms together, you would simply concatenate the node features um, and then have a single encoder. Uh, also, the encoders in the neural executor were all linear, um, which kind of works as long as your algorithm only requires a linear encoder, but if the algorithm requires a nonlinear encoder, then you kind of suck. And so we introduced these kind of latent encoders, which uh, are separate for different tasks. So we don't kind of just uh, concatenate the node features. Uh, and these operate on edges because this kind of makes sense. As I was showing uh, two slides earlier, um, the, what differs between algorithms is the fact that they have a different relaxed edge function and the relaxed edge function works on edges. So our encoders now encode entire edges rather than just uh, individual nodes. 
And these encoders uh, are also to be made more powerful um, in the sense of they're now two, uh, like contain two layers with a ReLU activation function. Now this has downside. So the upside of this is that there are a larger class of algorithms that you could possibly execute. But the downside is that now, if your algorithm is only needs a linear encoder, uh, it's much more likely to suffer in terms of its generalization performance. So uh, in general, adding model capacity on an algorithmic reasoning task tends to be quite a double-edged sword. Um, but this is kind of the major difference. And this was what we will just call the neural executor. And on the right-hand side, we'll just call it the neural executor plus plus, because it's just a slight change of the address. Yeah, so this is um, kind of the results on the transfer settings. So um, we test on Dijkstra, where we assume we don't have access to the intermediate steps. Uh, and we pre-trained on the PRIMS algorithm for the first algorithm, where we did have access to the intermediate steps. And on the second algorithm, we tested on most reliable, uh, and we pre-trained on the widest possible one. It doesn't really matter what those algorithms are. The main difference is that Prims and Dijkstra both have linear relaxed edge functions, while in most reliable and widest, they are, they are nonlinear. So we can see kind of across the board. So lower is always better, obviously. Uh, not, maybe not obviously, but in this table, lower is always better. Um, and we can see that as the number of nodes increases in the graph, so the training was always done on uh, graphs of size 20. So both 50 uh, node graphs and 100 node graphs were never seen during training. And we can see a drastic drop in performance. So while the error rate, um, for instance, for the neural executor frozen on Dijkstra was about 8% uh, on nodes of, uh, on graphs of size 20, uh, it, it jumps up to like 59% error rate and 60% error rate on larger graphs of size 50 and 100. And this trend is kind of consistent across uh, both algorithms and doesn't really depend on which kind of transfer technique you used, whether it was fine tuning, freezing, or uh, the double processor, even the double processor, the um, error rate, for instance, on, pre, uh, on the predecessor prediction uh, massively rises to 81% error rate uh, on most reliable and 30% error rate on, on predecessor for Dijkstra. Similar, this kind of is also true for the key prediction, where the key prediction will be very good uh, on the graphs of the size that you trained on, but very poor as you kind of ask it to predict on larger graphs. And so this kind of shows that the systematic generalization that algorithms have is not achieved in this setting. This is kind of as we expected. Um, so then on the next slide, uh, the, the, top, the top table for now is kind of where we uh, have the multitask approach, as I showed earlier. So again, uh, most reliable is uh, you want to find the path where if you multiply all the weights along the path, it's the highest, uh, it's the highest number. It's basically, imagine each edge weight was a probability, uh, and then basically you want to find the path with the highest probability. That's the most reliable uh, task. And uh, yeah, neural networks can't, can't do multiplication of inputs. Uh, of inputs. So this is uh, kind of very nonlinear for, for neural networks. Um, yeah, so the systematic generalization of uh, multitask learning is, I think, did it, is it the right thing? Yeah. Uh, is, is, is significantly better. So while in the previous table, we had a key error of like 10 to the four, we're now uh, at like 100. So we have uh, had significant uh, improvements there. Um, and then the last table, we have, which is where we uh, just compared to what extent the more powerful encoders were, uh, were an issue. So the idea was uh, the, these more powerful encoders might also harm systematic generalization. Uh, and so this is uh, just training with the intermediate steps on the Dijkstra problem, no pre-training whatsoever. Um, and we can see that the predecessor prediction on the neural executor plus plus is significantly higher. So it's like 52%. So we even do better in the multitask setting where we don't have access to the intermediate steps but pre-trained on prims um, than we do if we just straight up train on Dijkstra. This is because the nonlinear encoders make it much harder, make it much harder to learn something that systematically generalizes. As you can see, the performance on the graphs of the size that we trained on is, is excellent, but the systematic generalization is, is completely lacking. Uh, this becomes much less of a problem when the problem is nonlinear, as you can see. Here, the systematic generalization is much better compared to on Dijkstra. 
and there's much less of a drop off. Um, yeah. Next slide. So yeah, the, the key takeaways are um, too much model capacity can be harmful. So we can see that if the uh, linear kind of uh, alignment is, is best, um, transfer between algorithms doesn't help size generalization uh, whatsoever. Um, multitask, multitask can significantly help uh, systematic generalization. And um, the, I forgot the tables for the parallel, but they are in the same vein and the results hold for both the parallel and as well as the sequential. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take over from here. Um, and then, so I think, yeah, LP made some super interesting points that there's, there's benefits to algorithms, benefits to neural networks, benefits to combining them, and look at a bit more at like, uh, how, how, can, how can we learn multiple algorithms? How can we learn one algorithm if we don't have that much uh, intermediate uh, um, information about it? So, but here I'll talk a bit about how can we use this um, in practice is still in research. So uh, in, in particular, I talk about how can we use le learning um, to, to simulate algorithms in, uh, in reinforced learning. Uh, and this was done with, with my collaborators, with Peter, Ognien, Pierre-Luc, Jan, and Mladen. Um, so yes, if it was, yeah. So I talk about RL, but don't get uh, worried if you don't know much about RL. When I, when I started this project, I was coming from a pure graph representation learning background. So this was, uh, I, I tried to introduce the, from the basic points, and I think uh, this will still be interesting from, even if you just keep the GNN side in, in mind. So in RL, we have an agent that acts upon a word, uh, which sends back some observations of the word. Um, the, the agent uses this observation to ideally form a plan in its, uh, in its mind. Um, and based on observations, it, up, it updates this plan. And this plan dictates then how to, how to act short or long term. So to formalize these things, uh, we, have, um, acts, we have states. Uh, so that's what, what the agent sees. Uh, we have actions, so the, the, what, what it performs in the world. We have the policy, the transitions. So what, what are the probabilities of getting from to some state uh, if you're in a, in a current state S and you take some specific action A uh, and the rewards of taking this action A in, the, in a state S. Um, so the goal of this is what we want to optimize is to find the highest discounted cumulative reward. So basically the, to, to optimize for the biggest return the agent gets over, over uh, some time horizon. So planning is, so usually we, we think about policies in RL that act purely by adapting to some, what like the, the observed rewards. So these are called reactive. When we, however, when we, when we do it this way, when, when the agent just reacts to what the reward it observes, it requires a lot of data to actually learn the, subtl the subtleties of what it needs to do in this world to, to gather more rewards. And it's quite slow to adapt to changes. Uh, so when it is an unseen, an unseen scenario. Um, so planning ameliorates these issues by maintaining some, some models of the world. So either of the, of the state tradition model, so trying to anticipate in what state it will get, uh, that's sort of the intuition, of the, or trying to predict the reward it will get by doing some action in some state. And this is, these models are usually trained from observed trajectories. I think LP mentioned some time ago that some trajectories, like basically for algorithms give us trajectories in RL is the same. We have trajectories of what the agent does in the world. So some sequences of state action, state action, and so on. Uh, and reward, state action reward. So using this model, then the planner can simulate what happens if it takes some, some, some actions before actually taking these actions. And this is very, very important, especially if we want RL to work uh, in the real world in my view. Uh, so it gives us gains in data efficiency. So we don't actually need to gather all this data of what, what would happen if we have a good model that can predict um, what would happen without actually acting in the real, in the real environment. Um, and then if we have a strong model, we can sort of predict what would happen in an unseen, in an unexplored situation. Um, and th th that means we'd have higher, better adaptation to, to this unseen situation. And of course, if we, if we don't have to do the action to realize it's dangerous, then this would also allow us to have safer agents. And there's a lot of other uh, implications. And uh, what's interesting is that this has always already been uh, proven useful. So um, it, it's been impactful for game playing and in sciences. Um, and I think the, the interesting part is that it, it's also 
we have also have a good uh, theoretical uh, fundament on, upon to of, upon which we're building. So if we have a perfect model, we know this is going to give us perfect policies to act in the world. Uh, but this if so if we have a perfect model is the tricky part. Um, and here I'll talk about uh, this algorithm value iteration uh, that actually is able to do this to perfectly solve uh, an area environment given some some essential stuff. Uh, so if we have the reward and the transition uh, matrix, which, which I was talking about, then we are able to compute this value, this estimates of the values of the states. And uh, if basically this is a, an iterative algorithm that uh, refines the, the estimates and it's guaranteed to converge to optimal solutions. Uh, so after many, many iterations or here, depending on the environment, we can find these V stars that are the the optimal, the optimal estimate of how important a state is. What's its value? Is it good? Is it a bad state? Um, and so on. And then if we follow these values, then we can find the optimal policy by just taking the actions that maximize the expected value. So basically for in a state, we want to find the best policies, we'll move to the neighboring state that has the biggest value. That, that will be the signal we'll be following once we have these converged values. Uh, I see there are some questions. Um, if there's something that I should stop for, feel free to just raise a hand or something. Yeah, that's what I'm, uh, I'm raising my hand. Um, yeah. You're saying we're more data efficient if we do planning because we need less data to, like, yeah, if we go to back to the previous slide where you, yes. where you were saying, saying that, good model implies few interactions are needed to learn to act like we if we have a, a model of the world and it is good then yeah we know what to do and like we we have a policy given by, by our model by just choosing the uh, the action with the highest reward or the mm -hmm. highest value um mm -hmm. yeah but now how why why does that mean that learning is more efficient why? so basically the the data efficiency comes from the fact that we can query our model uh, and we can do plans like that are just that are not actually actions in the real world so it doesn't need to gather more data the learning is the same uh, but i think it, it's the learning is split in two it's like learning the model and actually learning uh, the things that are like how to use this model uh, so in, in that sense, is data efficient. We want actually to gather more data. Um, yeah, but to... if our model is bad, then it won't help us. Like the, the data yes. that we get from our model won't help us. And to get a non-bad yes. model, we need data. So like, is this bootstrapping actually helping? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, whether, yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of people have this debate. Like, is having a model, get, learning a good model as hard as getting like yeah. basically solving the problem. Um, I think like, for example, for learning a model, we have, we know some things, right? Like we know there's physical laws and we know some, some things that are just generally true for the environment our agents will see. And for that, we can, my view is that we can learn them separately. So we don't actually need to act in the world to learn these things, to put into the model, to be, to start from a decent amount, to, from a decent no amount of knowledge. Um, so, like it might require data, but I don't think it's the same sort of data that if we just yeah. throw a, a newborn into the world, basically there's like some some stuff we can pre-train it to know before uh, before it sees the environment. And like, is this a typical thing that everybody just says in reinforcement learning that like model-based reinforcement learning is more data efficient? Or is that something we could say? I think that's a general view from my, I, I'm still getting, yeah, up yeah. to up to speed with what what are the views in the reinforcement learning community. But I think there's, I mean, yeah, the, the opinions are split. That's why we have a model based community and we have a model free community. Uh, but I think one of the benefits it would be to have this data efficiency. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Are they okay? Uh, yeah. Just feel free to stop me. I, I won't be checking the chat, so I might not be seeing it uh, early enough. Yeah, it's just LP and cast discussing nicely. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I was I was saying that if we know some things like the reward function and the transition matrix, then we'll be able to do some super awesome stuff by using the value iteration algorithm. But the problem is, 
the problem is we usually don't know this stuff. So let's start from, we don't know the reward function, we don't know the transition matrix. So let's start from a simple case where we can assume some things. So if we assume the transition function matrix is fixed and known, um, and so for example, in this grid world, each state has some known neighbors up, down, left, right, and actions are deterministic. This is a, quite a simplified scenario, but it, it's been studied quite a while. So it, it's interesting to just by start looking at it. So in this case, doing value iteration means computing sums of neighboring values. Um, and this looks a bit like convolution. Um, so this has the nice benefit that we're doing convolution on a grid, which means that convolutional neural networks could help us by to learn this stuff um, as they have some natural alignment. And this is exactly what was leveraged in value iteration networks. Uh, so assuming these things, the, 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 the MDP, the, that uh, I, I didn't introduce the, the Markov decision process is discrete fixed and known. So we know the neighbors and everything else. Then we can do, do value iteration style computation by stacking uh, a like convolutional layers. Um, and this is differentiable. Um, we, we basically just use a convolutional neural network to, to align with this value iteration computation. Um, and there's some extensions to this paper that uh, extended from grid words to more, more generic uh, environments. Um, so this is GVINS. But the problem is that it still assumes quite important stuff. It assumes that the MTP is fixed and known, and that's something we won't be able to assume in our environment. So um, I think it, it's very interesting as a, as a starting point, but we should, we should think of it. Like what do we do when we don't know these things? Um, so if if we move to more to more complex environments, so in this case, um, like we need we need to estimate transition models, and we didn't have to have uh, continuous state spaces. And these are two two examples of of things that we should think how how do we address them uh, once we move uh, to to offer to a further case. So when we don't know the MVP, what would the uh, human future engineer do? So Usually, we like when we have a game. Usually, we would look like what is the we would associate some number or something to this. And we, if we know that there's some algorithm that's uh, important for solving the game, then after we abstractify this thing we've we've observed, we try to apply this algorithm we know is useful and get some answer from it. Uh, but what we want to do is to automate this first part, and well, we want also want to have this more robust, like more. A more robust part. Uh, so, but to start with the beginning, we want to automate the human feature engineer. So, we'll what we'll do is like what's been generally done in neural networks is that instead of having something that's uh, hand uh, hand engineered, we'll encode our state with a neural network, um, and we'll have we'll get an embedding rather than this abstract input. And then, uh, in order to to have the to be able to apply value iteration. I was talking about having these neighborhoods of states. So if you uh, if you look at this, this assumes that I, we know uh, some states that we can move from from our current state. We can move to this S prime to these neighbors. So in order to get these neighbors, we can use something like a tradition model, um, and it's optimized in a, by basically gathering like gathering some trajectories and uh, trying to learn. What comes so if I'm in S and I take some action, what would be the state that comes after? Uh, so if we call it S prime, basically we'll try to make this S prime be closer in space in the embedding space to S by taking action A than some random S tilde that we that is not the next state. So this model, this transition model, can be can be trained this in this way, in this contrastive learning way. Um, and to some of this, some of the people here, the way we train this might sound familiar. We use transfer for this. So I think this is very interesting, the, the, the connections between the, the different fields. So some, some technique that's traditionally used in knowledge graphs is actually very useful for building these local graphs in reinforcement learning. So to be specific, how do we use this? So we train a tradition model to basically do this, to discriminate between this uh, true S prime and this fake S tilde. And then we query this tradition model. So we're in this current state, we plug in all possible actions that, uh, that we could take from this state and we get some embeddings, how the next state would look like uh, using this transition model that we trained. So in this paper, we, we used breadth first search. So we, ex we expanded the graph exhaustively, uh, but this is not the only way. Like, of course we could do, we could do think some more on how to do some smarter expansion here. 
Um, and I'll talk about, about it uh, in the end. So now that we, we think we thought a bit on how to build this graph, so this, get these neighboring S primes. Um, and if we assume we have a reward value, so something to predict in each of these nodes, what's the reward of the, of the state, uh, then we can actually apply value iteration in, in a way. So we can apply this value iteration update rule. And this is exactly what happened in trick QN and A3C, um, also in value pred prediction networks. So to, to summarize a bit what they're doing, so they have a state, they, they embed it with using an encoder, then they take the actions, uh, they build this tree um, using their transition model, uh, the, the reward model gives them the value in each node, and then they can do, they can apply the actual algorithm, the value information algorithm, and they can they get updates of the values in each state. So uh, I want to be, yeah, okay, so I still have some time. So what, what we did so far, we, we mapped our natural inputs, pixels, to some space to abstract inputs, so we don't need a human to uh, abstractify our, uh, our game frame anymore. Um, Basically, we do we build this local MDP with the transition model, and we have some neural network to estimate the world values in every node, and this allows us to apply the evaluation algorithm on what we build, on what our neural network output is. And the evaluation is differentiable, and this means that this whole architecture that I showed from TQN and ATC um, is also differentiable. However, there's a there's a problem, and we call this problem the algorithmic bottleneck. So real world data is uh, incredibly rich. And by doing these things like predicting, uh, predicting a reward and using the algorithm on top of this few predicted reward, um, basically this means that we had to compress all this knowledge into, to, down to scalar values, values. So now the algorithmic solver, so this algorithm we're applying, commits to using the scalar because algorithms don't have any notion that the inputs you give it are actually not the inputs you want to use and assumes it's perfect. And if there is insufficiently like insufficient training data, then these reward values and all these things we estimated with neural networks uh, won't be correct. Um, and basically, if, if, if we have something incorrect going into the value iteration algorithm, like any algorithm, it will give something incorrect out. So something that won't be useful to us. Um, and we hit this data efficiency, efficiency issue again. But we started by saying that planning should help data efficiency. Um, having these models should help us not have to not have to train for very long after we, we have a good model. So th there's a problem here that we want to, to avoid. So we'll, we'll break the bottleneck by keeping everything in, um, in neural network land. So basically, we don't want to commit to scalars anymore. We don't want to have a single breaking point. Uh, and the as the SLP was mentioning at the beginning, there's there's some very nice parts about neural networks. They have uh, nice flexibility from their latent representations. Um, they are inherently high dimensional. So if any component is purely, purely predicted, the rest of it can can step in and compensate. So basically, maybe our latent space has some some part that is predictive of the value uh, of the reward. Uh, some of it is not, but overall, our, our latest picture will be better than predicting, putting all that weight in one scalar. That's, that was our hypothesis. So in order to break this bottleneck, we want to, to replace the value iteration algorithm with a neural network. So we want a neural network to simulate the value iteration algorithm. Um, and it, it, I, I don't think this comes as a surprise as we started uh, the talk by talking about this idea. So. To, to be precise, like precisely how, how we did it. So, uh, well, I, I keep, I'll start by making like a, a remark on the side. So if we have this GNN that does the value iteration um, and the same gradients are, are used to construct the graph and to do the value, the value iteration computations, then this might be a bit tricky. Like this might make the planner sort of be responsible for everything. So we want to, not have this problem. We don't want to construct and update the graph and do all this stuff at the same time. So what we do is we pre-train the graph neural network to perform value iteration, value iteration cell computations, and then freeze it and keep it in our in our uh, reinforcement learning agent. So as, as yeah, uh, this aligns with algorithmic alignment. Um, so now to be very precise on what's happening. So we have a, what we do like when we pre-train, we have this graph. Synthetic graphs um, where we keep node attribute the value. This starts usually with some random or some zero uh, as we don't have a good estimate at the beginning. 
uh, and we put some rewards. So this is all synthetic data. Basically, we can put anything as long as our uh, what we're trying to imitate the ground truth is actually coming from performing the value iteration algorithm. So we're doing this uh, intermediate steps to supervision. It's basically a supervised learning setup. The edge attributes are the transition metrics, and the gamma is something that we uh, that we decide uh, at the beginning. So basically, we train on random uh, transition matrices uh, and uh, and the rewards uh, for graphs of different sizes, and we test out of distribution. So this was something we wanted to make sure that what we what we pre-train um, what we pre-train on is not the we won't be the only thing that will be will know what to do. So basically. We want the value iteration algorithm to be learned properly. So to actually imitate the algorithm, not just to imitate on the specific graphs it's in. So uh, we want to evaluate some generalization and we optimize the mean squared error of this inter one step dynamics. Um, so right. is there a can question? We, yeah, can we have a quick question or point? Of course. Uh, is there the question here? I guess the hand was raised by accident, but yeah, yeah, some. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so there was an issue with my mic. Yeah, very quick question. Uh, <laughs> when you said we pre train, we pre train on these synthetic problems, I, I didn't quite catch it. Did you say we freeze the network and then deploy it or fine tune as you deploy? We freeze the network. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically we have this encoder, processor, decoder. Um, we we throw away the encoder and the decoder, so the one that was actually supposed to predict the values for the specific graphs it's in, and we keep the processor, and that's what we'll use in the reinforcement learning agent. So the processor is supposed to just do the value iteration update, that one, that equation that uh, I kept showing around. Uh, so it's supposed to do this one step, that's what the processor is supposed to, to learn. And it's quite nice because it aligns well with message passing. So the fact that we're learning this with the graph neural network should, should help um, like how quickly and how well we can imitate this road. If there is any other questions, I'm I'm happy to answer. Okay, so putting it all together, basically we have this encoder. Uh, so that was the part trying to to not have to have somebody abstractify our frame. Uh, we have the transition model, so that's how we build a local graph. Uh, because sometimes we might not be able to get like all the states and build a full graph of what's going on in the environment. Usually we won't be able to do, um, most of our environments are not fully uh, searchable. So we have this local graph that we're building with the transition, uh, transition model. Um, then we use this pre-trained GNN that we just pre-trained to imitate value iteration. So that's all it knows how to do. Um, and what it does is basically what, so basically what, what we wanted to do is that it, it starts with some estimate of the value in this state it's, it's currently in, and it does one step of value iteration. So this, the estimate after the update of the state should be better than what it started with. It should slowly converge to, to some good estimate of the value of the state. And uh, then basically like after we have this better uh, representation of the current state, we plug it into like any RL algorithm of choice. In our case, we use PPO. We predict actions, we predict values, and uh, we update the entire network uh, based on, on how, how those look. So some results, uh, just want to make sure I still have some of them. Okay, I'll go quickly through them. So basically we looked at low data um, performance. So we, we, looked, we trained on very, very few trajectories. We saw that it's able to, to solve the game. Uh, for Cardboard, for example, uh, we looked, is it important on how, what sort of graphs we pre-trained? So do they, can they be random or do they have to be something that looks a bit like the environment? And we saw uh, in some cases it makes a difference, but overall, it, I think we can, we can say that we can just pre-train on random graphs and use the same executor on all the games and it will still work. So we also looked at some Atari environments. Um, I think what's um, interesting to notice is that um, Basically, Excelvin is very strong in in low data ca cases. So, in in the first of in the first half of training, it it al already gets some nice advantage in front of the baseline, which is the one with without transition model, without uh, executor, so just a, a simple PPO agent. And ATC, which is the the net the architecture I was mentioning earlier, where they do the actual value iteration algorithm on the predicted 
reward and, uh, and transition. So with this in mind, uh, we also looked a bit at why does it work? We had some hypotheses. We, we assumed that this executor learns to do validation. It, uh, it learns how to estimate nice values. So, and that's very useful for, for our agent. So what we did here, we looked at how good uh, the embeddings are at predicting value, the optimal values uh, before and after this executor update. So theoretically, after the executor update, it should be better uh, at being predictive of, of the value. And that's what we noticed. It's actually very, very good. It's almost perfect at predicting the values. And we test this on some, on some grids where we can actually compute the optimal values. And we also uh, study another thing, um, which is how important is this bottleneck? Um, is the, if, the, if those scalars that we're predicting are inaccurate, um, it, will the value iteration algorithm give us useful uh, things as output, or will they not be useful enough to actually be used in the environment? Uh, and how does this compare with the things that are outputted by our engine? And what we saw is that if we perturb if these uh, inputs, Basically, the more the, the more you perturb, the less useful the outputs of the of the of the algorithm will be. So I think this this sort of shows that there is some bug bottleneck here that we should be careful. Of. So to, to sum up, basically we looked at the RL part, like how to formulate optimal plans. I introduced value iteration. Um, we we looked at some very specific cases. So when we know uh, a lot of things about the MDP, the value iteration nets. Um, looked at this case. Um, and then also the case where we can apply the algorithm, where we want to apply the algorithm directly. Um, and in, in doing this, we discovered this bottleneck effect, uh, which means that we need more data before planning can emerge. Um, and as we are saying, data efficiency is one of the main points of, of proponents of planning. So we said to break the bottleneck in our agent Excel uh, and we showed some nice results in low data uh, cases. Um, when we, where we saw that also doing the actual evaluation algorithm requires like it does catch up the the model does catch up in um, in the end, but it does require more time to do it. And we also looked at why it works. So some more high level conclusions. Uh, I think real world solutions can benefit from combining classical algorithms and neural networks. Um, graph neural networks are well suited to imitate dynamic programming algorithms and we know some various with dynamic programming algorithms so we should take we should take advantage of this um, transfer between algorithms is possible and it's best done in a multitask way and that's very nice uh, because one of my wishes is that we'll be able to actually use multiple algorithms at once and not just one systemic in the, uh, systematic generalization without intermediate steps is possible um, if we have access to some uh, similar algorithm traces uh, and as I was saying, there's some known algorithms that are useful in RL. I gave an example, but there's a lot more if you if you think about it. I might I might be pointing to one here in this picture. Um, and having some algorithmic reasoning components as part of the agent brings, brings nice benefits. Low data efficiency being one such example. So some future work thoughts. Um, these are just some some things that came. Um, in the in, in discussions in the last time. So as I was mentioning, the transition model is not the most efficient thing we could be doing. Um, there's, there's a lot to explore there. There's some papers that are very interesting in this space. Uh, the rollout policy, so maybe we don't need to expand the that graph in exhaustively. Um, and I mentioned like, we, here, we're looking at graph algorithms where we have a specific number of edges uh, but what happens if we don't if we don't have this, if we have continuous action space? So basically here the edges were different types of actions, but if we have a continuous action space, we won't be able to do this. And uh, we have a current collaboration on, with this, uh, on this with uh, some people from University of Cambridge. Um, and something that gives me quite a bit of hope is that there's a lot more algorithms that we haven't explored, not as many, but still a, a nice amount that we can look at. Um, and we haven't really looked at applying multiple algorithm, algorithms and composing them in different ways so far. Um, and also a nice paper that uh, I recommend you look at if you like some of the parts we, uh, we talked about uh, where they do a similar idea, but instead supervised learning. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, feel free to send us your thoughts or um, ideas, questions. Uh, to this email, so thank you to our collaborators, Jan Tang, our uh, supervisor, Petar Velichkovic, Ognev Milikovic, Pilu Bakoa, and Lada Nikolic, and the members of our group for useful discussions and the wider Mila community. All right, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, it's a really nice presentation. And to me, it's kind of 
it, it's just very surprising that this uh, that works. <laughs> like we're kind of learning a general tr trainer, so to say, or that yeah, that this transfer works. Cool. But then um, I, I suppose Cao Cheng Su has a question. Very nice talk. So I have a question. How do you apply the value iteration to uh, learn the transition model for, uh, in, in continuous space? Uh, can I understand it as trying to regularize the, uh, the transition model uh, with, the, with the, how to say, the, the value iteration, that equation, uh, using that equation to regularize the continuous uh, prediction from the transition model? Because uh, uh, in, in continuous space, you have uh, infinite number of states. And uh, how do you apply that? Yeah, so I think we we basically abstractify this by the fact that we're looking at latent space. So we are in our current state that is embedded in some latent encoding. And at this yeah. point, we don't care if what encoded was discrete or continuous. It's just something encoded. Um, the tricky part is whether the action is discrete or continuous, because basically there, uh, mm -hmm. So if I go to back to my transition model, uh, yeah. So basically, this one um, mm -hmm. we optimize where we feed in like this a um, as a as an argument here is just like a latent space uh, encoding. So this we take all possible actions, and that's how we train this transition model. So that's the but the, basically the the short answer is it doesn't care if the state is because it it already looks at it being embedded. So it doesn't look at the it, it looks at the what comes out of the encoder. Oh, uh, okay, I see. So the also the output as prime is also an uh, embedded uh, uh, representation yes. of the state. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, there's also like a, a different uh, like line of work with transition models where they actually try to predict uh, in the in the in the observation space, and we tried something like this, but that's quite tricky because so we actually looked at this game. And uh, here the goal is for the chicken to cross the road. And what we saw is that the word model we used basically was ignoring the chicken. It was just like learning to, to imitate the, the lines in the game and so on. So I think from, and from some other papers, contrastive learning is sort of better at this point than, than the other types of learning transition models. I see, thanks. Thank you for the question. Thank you a lot for the presentation. So it's uh, it's very interesting, and I'm also surprised like to see um, uh, how it works and to to see that the the beginning of learning real algorithms to to solve tasks. Um, I have some questions regarding this uh, uh, the the part about like transferring knowledge across tasks. So one of the the key results uh, that you show is that taking the weight and transferring them to a new task doesn't work. It often leads to negative transfer. Um, and yeah, I, I know that you haven't done the experiments yet, but um, it would be very, very interesting in future work to, to see what, what's going on. Like uh, why when you train on the two tasks simultaneously, uh, it performs better than if you train on one and fine tune on the other using, for example, um, some kind of uh, so, so some kind of interpretability of what's going on, like trying to understand how did the network learn the first task, how did it learn the second task, and how it learned the two tasks simultaneously, and see what's the difference there. And I think this will uh, this will kind of help build future work to improve how transfer learning is done to really see like why. Um, well, what's the difference between the, the two things that are learned? No, for sure. Um, and I think as somebody mentioned in the chat, uh, various continual learning methods might be maybe more appropriate um, to, to kind of try uh, and teach from one task to the next um, as a way of transferring rather than just brute forcing the transfer approach by just saying these are the original weights of the, um, of the pre-trained task. Um, but yeah, that, that sounds like a, a very good future work kind of direction. Was there a specific uh, question like, as well in there, or was it more of a comment? 
No, it, it was more of a comment. Um, something else uh, I wanted to mention here is uh, right now you tried only training on one task and fine tuning on another task, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, one of the idea here is to show whether the algorithm can generalize from one task to the other, but then you, you only train on one and fine tune on the other. And it would be interesting to see, for example, if you train on five tasks simultaneously in the multitask setting that you showed work better, uh, then can you transfer to a sixth task? Like to, yeah, to so we, 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 we tried this uh, where we pre-trained on four, not five, but um, I didn't have it in the slides here, but there is a okay. table in the, in, the, in the paper. I think it's the, the last table. Uh, I can check. It's table. Uh, it's table. It's table five um, where we tried this and uh, it still it still fails to actually improve the classical transfer approach. Um, okay. Um, let me uh, I think Dominique might be better. Maybe if you can show the the table on the screen. Uh, I think it's table five. Oh, we have we have two people screen sharing. And this was faster than me. Uh, yeah, I think table five at the top. So we pre-trained on Prims, Dijkstra, depth first search for sequential, and then for the parallel algorithms, we train we trained on breadth first search and Bellman Ford, and then we predict uh, for most reliable. Um, there's most reliable can be executed in both a parallel and a sequential way. Um, okay. And, and so did, you, can... did you no notice some kind of improvement from training on four tasks, or it was as bad as? Uh, I mean, I mean, you could on... look at the number. It's it's roughly the same thing. It, it doesn't seem to improve anything. Okay. Or at least not significantly enough that it would be worth it. Also, there was a question earlier in the chat about like uh, what is exactly the most reliable. Um, I think most uh, most people here are not necessarily familiar with the algorithmic reason. Oh, it doesn't. I mean, sure, I can explain the algorithm, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, there are two different algorithms. Um, most reliable treats the weights as probabilities, and so you want to find the path which has the highest probability, where you multiply all the probabilities along the path. Like for instance, this is a thing in internet routing where you want um, to find where each link has a probability of dropping the packet or something, and so you want to find the path where there's no packet. Um, it's it's not. Like the actual, what the actual problem is, isn't really important. The point is, can we transfer between some of them? Yeah. So we just have a, some random task and we see that we can do the transfer. Yeah. But then, Eun, uh, no, Eun, sorry. Okay, yeah. That's just what, yeah. Th thanks for what was definitely a very interesting uh, presentation. I think especially the transfer learning, like this was a very surprising result in terms of my intuitions about how it should work. For the learning without intermediate step situation, you mentioned you tried uh, you, you tried like training without any intermediate steps and without transfer learning. I mean, in those cases, how what was the setup in terms of like the number of iterations you let the algorithm run for was it adaptive computation time or was it like um so the, the network uh i didn't i didn't mention this but the network has so in the when when there is no information sorry when there is no intermediate steps uh we simply tell it the number of true iterations uh it needs so in the sequential it would be the size of the graph because obviously you take one node out of the priority queue at a time. Um, and for the parallel, it will be a much smaller number, but we just tell it the correct number of iterations it would need to execute to kind of solve the problem. Um, so we gave that uh, hint uh, in the setting where there was no intermediate steps. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think. And yeah, one other thing uh, for the compositionality thing, like, yeah, partly following on from the thing you mentioned about compositionality and partly from the, oh, what happens if we 
pre-train on like five, five different tasks. For the five different tasks, were they all using the same edge embedding? like the embedding that you calculate from the weights and then sort of having some flag to the processor. So like the processor becomes a bit like an ALU saying, oh, do we learn to take the max of max plus or do we learn to say do max times or whatever? Or is it that we learn individual encoders for like each of the different algorithms? And so in uh, the second case, like, is the processor actually doing anything? What do we what do we hope that we are transferring? Like in the case where you said, okay, we're going to do transfer learning. What was the hypothesis for the actual information that we're gaining by doing the transfer learning? So the encoders are indeed separate across different algorithms, but the encoders only consist of um, the standard fully connected layers, right? So the processor contains a graph neural network. So the yeah. Uh, the encoders can only at best learn a function on the either the nodes, the edge weights, or the the the, the 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 edge. But to actually be able to kind of assemble and aggregate information, you need the processor. And what the processor learns, for instance, in the sequential setting, is uh, that of executing a priority queue. So you need to keep track of out of all of these neighboring nodes, which one was the minimum. I need to select that one and only update that one. Uh, and that process is, must be learned by the processor because it's the only one who can compare between different nodes in the uh, in the neighborhood. This can't be done by any of the encoders because the encoder is always the same, right? So uh, it just computes a, a key that the processor then uses for comparison and can then use to kind of determine uh, how to operate next. But this must be learned by the processor, so the the encoder can't learn that part. And this is kind of the part we hope to transfer, right? And if you look at the pseudocode again, the relaxed edge function is kind of the computation of the key. And the processor is kind of uh, then the update function it learns how to update nodes given this key information. Right. So it's like what you hope, you hope that like oh by learning a shared embedding, say essentially we learn we learn a way to project edge weights into some embedding such that the max function or the min function is always the same. Yeah. Right. This is kind of the similarity we assume exists between algorithms. So for instance, we did try this. Uh, I don't think we have the, I don't think we ever bothered to actually compute a full table, but if you try to transfer from like Bauman Ford to Dijkstra, you would, it would not work at all. So you do need the algorithms to be similar. Right. Yeah, what, what, one, one final, yes. Sorry about all the questions, but like just one final Sorry. remark. Uh, when you're okay, so like if we're saying what you're doing is learning this shared encoding that essentially you learn a min or you learn a max function, is have you tried using something like say the discrete numeric encoding from like neural execution engines or something, or even something like a neural ALU? Sort of in, in the sense of because I, I remember that the problem you were saying with the nonlinear functions is you can't extrapolate outside of the range. And I guess like unless you have unbounded sort of execution time, we can't learn a multiplication function that strongly generalizes unless it's something like neural execution engine on fixed length binary words or something. Yeah, but so that was more of a composition. Like, so those papers looked more at like compositionality, right? So they they learned uh, a neural network module that could do multiplication, and then they tried to reuse that. So they were kind of composing their different neural networks that had to learned on several useful subtasks, in which one of them was multiplication, which is a bit different from this problem where we just want a processor that learns to execute this algorithm. So we don't want to have to worry too much about, uh, you know, does our, does our uh, architecture contain a multiplication module? Does that make sense? Kind of, a, yeah, kind of, I think, yeah, I, I, I think I, I was just thinking, oh, is it that we're trying to learn a better embedding, essentially learn a high dimensional version of the algorithm that connects the combinatorial black box, in which case, I guess you might want something like, if you can say, use this alternative high dimensional embedding of numbers versus like, 
yeah, if, if you're trying to see, can we just learn this thing end to end and see what sort of embeddings we can learn. I see. Yeah, thanks. But Felipe, you don't have to, to hesitate, just speak up. Uh, okay, okay, so can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so I wanted to ask something uh, about uh, something you mentioned in uh, part 6.1 of the paper, uh, which is that uh, an alternative explanation is that given a good processor, uh, the a new encoder cannot really learn what uh, what encoding is necessary for that processor to work well, so you end up getting uh, poor performance. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to ask, like, what what kind of indications uh, brought you to, to this alternate hypothesis, and whether you think it's plausible that some kind of architectural change might reveal that actually it is possible uh, to to do transfer without multitask learning, like whether it might be some kind of tweak in, in the encoder, for example, or some different uh, training routine that, mm -hmm. that might fix that. Um, so, um, for instance, maybe additional loss regularizers could help fix that. So it might not necessarily need to be an architectural change, it could just be a, a change in how you train it. So maybe various like regularizing um, kind of losses could help here. Um, I think we had an experiment that one of the reviewers asked where we checked whether or not we could recover the original task. So given that we trained the encoder, processor, decoder, uh, we then throw away the encoder and decoder, but retrain on that same task without the intermediate steps. Can you recover kind of decent enough encoders and decoders? And that seemed possible. Um, so that gives us some more information about that type of problem. It doesn't really answer the question. It's very hard to kind of answer the questions, yes or no, especially with the kind of lack of interpretability of neural networks. Um, as to what architectural changes might help uh, with that problem, uh, again, I think that's kind of uh, kind of a trial and error, or like you you just need to try and write uh, create a new architecture. It's it's very hard to say without having tried it. It's um, yeah, it's very hard to kind of predict what the outcome of such an experiment might be. Um, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, but I think the the experiment you uh, you said you did because the reviewer asked it. Yeah, it, it is enlightening, and if you can recover the the original task, then uh, maybe it's not going to do with the work. Yeah, I think those results will, will be in the appendix. Mm, okay, yeah. If I remember correctly. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I think it's experiment two, appendix 8.2. Um, yes, table 20, in case you wanted to look at the results. Well, there you have it. But I mean, I mean, there are always more experiments that could be done, and but we've had many to to see that this approach actually, or yeah, to 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 evaluate the transfer. And in my opinion, the transfer results are pretty uh, surprising in, in some ways. Cool, but thank you for your for your awesome papers and uh, also thanks for for having this discussion with us today and explaining your papers, answering so many questions, and yeah, the, the very nice presentation. Thank you very much for having thank us. Thank you for having us. Good. Then. If you have any any other thoughts, feel free to email us. Yeah. All right. Yeah, for me, it's this this type of stuff was completely. Um, or it's completely out of my, my realm of uh, what I'm us usually into. So the papers took a long time, but it was definitely worth it. So yeah, maybe we can get into some, uh, some more um, natural science applied or molecule applied stuff uh, with some future paper, papers of LT. Cool. Yeah. But then I think let's call it a day for today and see you, everyone. See you. Yeah, bye. Bye. Thank you.
a very different topic from what we usually have, but nevertheless very exciting. And if you want to join our upcoming sessions, then you will find all of the information in the description where you also have links with the mailing list or the Slack channel where you will get weekly updates.